Ok, Pero, quedamos con inglés y español, no hay problema. Voy a, voy a abrir el OBS y lo voy a grabar por OBS. De acuerdo, muy Uy. bien, gracias. Yo voy a ver, listo. Ok, pues vamos a iniciar, entonces voy a dar acceso a, al resto de, de la gente. Eh, Rubén, quedó abierto tu micrófono. Cuando vea las participantes eh. entrando y después inicio. Ok. okay. Cerramos micrófono. Sí, mi querido Javier. Muy buenos días a todos. Un buen día, don José. ¿Cómo estamos? Bueno, ya veo que la gran mayoría ha entrado, así que creo que siendo las 10 de la mañana podemos iniciar. Welcome everybody, muy buenos días a todos. Eh, muchas gracias por asistir a este evento regional. Eh, en este momento voy a... Thank you for participating in this regional event. Now I give the word to Sheila Wilkin, who's always here with us, so she can explain how we are going to handle the translation or interpretation options. Good morning. I'll give you a brief explanation of interpretation. I'll explain it in both languages. Of interpretation in English and Spanish. Um, verán un globo en la parte inferior de su pantalla donde pueden escoger el español o el idioma que desean oír. Uh, you'll see an icon at the a globe at the bottom of your screen where you can choose the language that you wish to hear. The interpretation option has already been enabled. Ya está habilitada la opción de la interpretación. Gracias. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Sheila. Thank you very much, Sheila. I will start in Spanish because I see most of our participants are Spanish speakers, but I'm certain that Sheila and her team are rendering the English interpretation. Welcome everyone to this annual conference held for the fourth consecutive year, and we call it Metrology for the Digital Transformation Sync Conference for 2023. So this conference is always held by the 14th working group called N4DT for the transformation metrology of the SIM. This is our last working group that was ever created. Obviously, through it, we thank them for allowing us to be here with you as chair of the SIM. Those who do not know me, I am Javier Aria, and I am holding the chair of SIM up to 2025, but I am the director of the National Metrology Center for Panama. So before we begin with the event, usually I wish to give you some brief reminders. First, I want to notify you that this event is being recorded from the beginning all the way to the end. The videos in the slides will always be available in the Congress website if you wish to visit them. We ask you to please keep your microphones and cameras off throughout the entire conference unless you are requested to turn them on for either a photograph or interventions. And obviously, you can do all your questions throughout the presentations by using the chat. And once we finish the presentation sessions from each one of the speakers, the speakers will be able to answer your different questions post posted on the chat. So whenever you put a question forward, please state who you're asking the question so we can try to better address your question quickly. Right now, without further ado, I welcome everyone to this fourth conference. I also want to thank you for being here on behalf of the Metrology Inter-American International Metrology System. Thank you very much for organizing this event and thank you for participating. So right now, I wish to give the floor to Dr. Hugo Gasca so he can 
start with this conference launching the first block of the metrology quality infrastructure, Dr. Hugo Gasca. He's the current president of the 14th working group of SIM. And he's also a member of the Statistics and Uncertainty Group and vice chair of the INMECO TF6 on digital transformation. He started to collaborate with the Metrology Center as management coordinator, leading the national standardization program in Mexico. And he specialized in a probability and statistics. Without further ado, Hugo. You have the floor, so you may start with this conference. Welcome and good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Javier, for the excellent welcoming. And we are going to start with a brief introduction of the first block called Quality Infrastructure. I am going to share my screen. Can you verify that you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. It will be very brief. This is metrology for digital transformation. And here we're talking about quality infrastructure. Welcome to this fourth annual conference. Briefly, the background, and then a little bit about what is happening, a little bit of the future. What is going to happen? They started a little bit before 2017, uh, by the end of 2017, but digitalization as a project came about in Germany for digital certification, some events, the creation of the ad hoc group. The next year in 2021, we have even more virtual workshops on awareness to share this need at the worldwide. We had some virtual workshops, some in person, in the collaboration that we had with IMECO in 2021, we have a project with the IDB and it's still running and we will be finishing this year. Part of the initiatives that were launched in 2020, 2021 and during the pandemic was to establish the M4DT base once a month, and now we hold it every two months. That really helps us to create this, the digital capacity building. And it runs into 2022, 2023. It will keep on running currently. We have the 2023 standards. We have this conference. And we will have a strategic workshop to close up the IDB project with two essential projects focus on the 14th working group. The first one would be the DCC and the, the digital THP. For more information, you can connect with the servers of SIM. Next year, we will have the MECO 2024 conference. We will share the inv invitation. Please register yourself. Certainly next year, we will have the next conference and we will carry on with strategic workshops and we're going to provide continuity with new projects. So obviously, this is a global effort, not just for the Americas, nor just for SIM. We have in um, Euramet that are a couple of years ahead of us. And we have the Asia Pacific, IMECO East Europe, but we also have COMED and we have other regions and some efforts in IOML that we don't see here 
in accreditation bodies. So this slide is basically the vision that we have for 2017. This is Frank Hirsch's adaptation of a work done from 2007 from the World Bank on the quality infrastructure where we have the National Metrology Institute and International National Standard Office, the accreditation bodies and all the secondary accredited labs. And these have the information flow of metrology all the way to society through the industry, through the academia and through certification bodies. And what you see here would be these documents that have been added here. They represent the idea of how we can implement the digital calibration certificate will help the DCC will help this in this chain to provide added value for metrology in the digital area. We did this last year and it was extended to a new vision. This is the vision that we have in 2017. And now the vision in SIM in Panama, we set this one forth last year. So these little boxes, so basically same diagram with added boxes, blue boxes, IOML, and the BIPM with CIPM. And in red, you would see in addition to what you understand from the DCC, we have other services, metrological services that require digitalization. We're talking about smart standards. We're talking about calibration, accreditation, something that we will hear from our colleague and friend, Michael Schwartz on the scope of accreditation in a digital format. Janet will also share from BIPM all the efforts that they're doing. This is more or less a digital report of key comparisons and CMCs that we already have some progress. And at the IOML level or ISO, we have in smart standards. So basically, that is the vision that we have, the integrated vision of all the metrological services that we see that in the near future, we'll have a digital version. Everything trickled all the way down to industry, to the citizens, the public in general, going through industry and the research chain. So basically, this is it. and. A summary of what we're going to look at as a progress within the region. And this will be in the second block for today and tomorrow. We have developments in mass calibrations, automated mass calibrations, ongoing monitoring like smart meters. We have an example also. We have two examples of customer based platforms, information, authenticity, and security artificial vision using OCR and new metrological services that are being developed in some cases, some other digital twins. So this is basically the overview of what we will be looking at these two days. And Let me introduce you to our first speaker. This is Janet Mars, and she's the leader for digital transformation for measurements. She is a renowned metrologist with BIPM certificates and the director of the metrology publications that we already know. Before joining the BIPM, her research work was in the area of astrophysics spectrometry, and that has given her added knowledge. And she's part of the digitalization working group, and she's a member of the Code Data Working Group 
for digitalization of measurements. She is also the main contact of the BIPM. I think she's the only contact for the signees of the joint statement of intent whenever they become members of BIPM. And this year in November, we'll have the digitalization forum. She will share a summary of the highlights of the digital transformation. Welcome, Janet. Thank you very Janet, much. Up the floor. Thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen then. So I hope everybody can see that. And with apologies to the translators, I'm probably going to talk reasonably fast so you can look at it in a slow down version afterwards. That's the that's the beauty of video recording it. So I'm going to be talking about some of the digital references in support of measurements that we're developing at the BIPM. And of course, the SI reference point that I'm sure many of you will have already heard about. So to, I'm going to start with CMCs, which indeed were already mentioned by Hugo. Now we're developing a new service, or we put online a new service, um, and this is the human end, the, the front end for people. You can see there's a PID for the CMC. This is already built into the KCDV. And this is something that is particular to that particular edition of that particular CMC. You can see it's made up of several parts. There's the RMO, there's the area, the domain of metrology, there's a two letter code for the country and there's an eight letter code for the CMC and at the end there's a, a number that gives it the version so this is version two of this particular CMC there's information about the date there's information about the service categories this is another PID that you can and here are two ROR's and Wikidata identifiers, again, these are PIDs for the NMI. So this is a way of making the machine understand what CNAM is. We as people know, but a machine needs to be told that it's an institute, and this is one way of doing it. And finally, on this page, we have the ID for this institute service. So I hope that that is a PID, which means, would mean that if it's changed, the letters would change as well, the code would change. And finally, the part that will be translated by the SI reference point. So this service, this new service, is available at the following link, sidigitalframework.org, KCDB CMC, followed by the exact identifier that you can collate from the KCDB. I said this was version number two. And if you look at version number two, you'll see the dates at which it was available, at which it was valid, and that it was super, superseded by this version two we've just looked at. So the beauty of this is if you build into your calibration certificates this link, then whoever looks at the certificate to check whether the uh, CMC was valid, they will see that, yes, indeed, it was valid at the time of the certificate and give you the information that was valid at the time of the certificate. And this is something that the KCDB doesn't do because the KCDB always presents the most up-to-date information. So, so that you can find more information about that, because that was a very quick overview, please look on the BIPM website, help on the KCDB and this document, CMC Unique Identifiers. Some institutes have already started uh, inserting into their calibration certificates this sort of sentence. This calibration service is underpinned by the CMC and you give the reference. Now, if it's a printed CMC, of course, the only way you can build in a link on the printed version is through a QR code. But what we will need to do next is to make an ontology so that the machine can understand that a calibration service is related to a CMC a calibration service is related to an NMI, et cetera. That ontological understanding so that machine will really understand this sentence 
is yet to come. That's a small update that I hope will be put in place next year. Now, the same idea can be uh, applied for calibration, um, sorry, for um, service categories. So whether or not an NMI has CMCs published in the KCDB, it's possible to say something like this service corresponds to whichever service category. And again, we have an identifier, as I showed you before. Now, this is really useful because um, oh, that was an example of what you might see behind the scenes. But the there's ontological modeling underway. The service categories will be mapped to the associated quantities. That's underway by a number of the CCs, particularly CCTF and CCPR and CCM have made good strides. The others are yet to be done. And in any case, this will be published before the end of the year for physics and ionizing radiation, even if not all of the quantities have been built in. So I hope that this will help digitalize the description of NMI services and indeed scopes of accreditation. So I hope, um, I see Mike Schwartz is uh, speaking today. I'd very much encourage linkage from the NCSLI taxonomy work to the service categories, which have been defined in the KCDB. Now, a brief look at the SI reference point, which will be the authoritative digital reference for the International System of Units. So this is basically a machine compatible version of the SI brochure. In fact, not just the current brochure, but the previous ones as well. And I hope you all know the SI brochure. It contains the definitions of the SI base units. It lists SI units uh, with special names, such as Newton for the unit of force. It gives the underpinning constants that are used to define the SI uh, units, the quantities such as force for the Newton, the prefixes. Uh, the non-SI units accepted for use will of course be defined elsewhere. Um, so that's something we will build in later, but we do have the related decisions of the CGPM and the CIPM. All in ontological, encoded, fully encoded format. So this will be an official reference. It doesn't change anything if you're already using another unit representation system, which you may continue to use, of course. Um, all the unit representation systems, um, particularly if they do point as an anchor to the SI reference point, will be able to be fully interoperable through this units of measure interoperability service that's been developed uh, particularly by Stuart Chalk at uh, NIST, or in conjunction with NIST. So the development of the SI reference point, I should acknowledge in particular, Gregor Dudley and Stuart Chalk and Jean Laurent Hippolyte, who I didn't main, um, mention, but has been in charge of the service categories work. Uh, the current status is there is an alpha version for testing. The Java coding is being put in place, and thank you, Armin. And there will be a period in October of beta testing by selected groups, such as the Codata Drum and the CIPM expert group and CIPM task group, and open beta testing for you all in November. This is just a brief view. So we haven't looked at the uh, graphic design yet. So it will um, be improved slightly. But um, this, for instance, is an API call uh, shown in web version for people. Give me all the SI base units. So you can see the start, there's an ampere, including its states of validity, the defining resolution, the defining constant, the defining kind, the defining equation, and certain other sentences, other bits of information that have been brought out of the SI brochure. So as I say, this is fully ontologically encoded. There are knowledge graphs underneath, which means that they can be interrogated directly through Sparkle queries, either by individuals who know the language Sparkle or by big, um, big boxes such as uh, Google Artificial Intelligence, et cetera pre-programmed queries that will be accessed through an API or through the web interface. That's the same, same thing, always using the TTL files as, an, as input data. And there'll be a parser to allow 
units and quantities, specific, uh, specifically combined ones, to be interpreted dynamically if they're entered using a, an agreed syntax, which I've indicated below. And of course, more information about that will be made available. On the SI digital framework, sort of the wider picture, I've indicated here the SI digital framework in the middle and the SI reference point up at the top. So there'll be the SI API. And for each one, we've shown where there will be a web interface and where there'll be an OWL ontology. So ontologically encoded means that a machine will really be able to understand the context of the information it's being provided. So I mentioned the KCDB service category part, which is being looked after by Jean Laurent, and it will have the subset of service categories for each individual field. And in the T box, that's the part that explains the links between the different the different um, components that you see in them. And the bodies, of course, will include the meetings and the resolutions. And the APIs will be through a normal API interface, such as the Swagger Hub. We have a number of services already available. Uh, You'll have seen the KCDB API, but recently we have um, beta versions made available for timescales data and for the standard frequencies for the practical realization of the meter. And you go ask me to say a few words on uh, liaisons and collaborations, because of course at the BIPM, we have a fairly central position. So not only will we be um, looking forward to meeting with all the NMIs, or as many NMIs have applied for the forum on metrology and digitalization. For the preparatory meeting, you're all welcome. Please register when, that's, uh, when that opens. The CIPM task group and the expert group will close when the forum opens, but they have been very active in looking at what the CIPM should be concentrating on. And we have a joint statement of intent that has been signed by the following organizations uh, with a meeting coming up in September. And the, the plan is that in a week in March, so from the 5th to the 6th for the workshop and the 6th to the 7th for the plenary meeting of the forum, there will be a major um, grouping and the workshop will be on fair data in the quality infrastructure at, um, on site at the BIPM. Uh, I can also advertise the BIPM webinar on 12th of October. And of course, um, I'm involved in the Code Data Drum, and they're doing very valuable work, or particularly related to the constants. So I've just highlighted here a number of the organizations with which we have special arrangements. So with OIML, we're working to coordinate the next meeting of the signatories. With NCSLI, we have interacted about the taxonomy, and that's something I'd like to follow up again. ISO and IEC were in contact with respect to the ISO 80,000, ISO IEC 80,000 series, co-data with the constants, and CIE with um, various data sets linked to the mise en pratique of the candela. So there we go. I've reached the end of my flying tour and questions are welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Janet. Uh, the, we will continue with the next speakers and at the end of the block, we will answer all the questions. Please remember, you can write your uh, questions at the chat and keep them uh, so we can collect them and, uh, and try to answer all of them at the end of the block. Thank you very much, uh, Janet, for your interesting and uh, uh, complete point of view and your speak. Uh, it was an amazing presentation, Janet. Thank you very much. So we will continue then with our next speaker on digital transformation opportunities by Dr. Sasha Eisted. Dr. Sasha Eisted is from the De Metrology Department in the PTV. He's been joining us since 2021. He had a degree in mathematics. Mm -hmm. 
He has a mathematics degree from 2008 from the Humboldt University in Berlin and physical theory degree. He is a passionate metrologist in 2008 when we, he joined the mathematic modeling group in PTB to work on instant uncertainty for time measurements. In 2017, he started his journey with digital transformation with the digitalization coordinating working group. And also he's part of the PTB chair group. And he also led the working group for Eudamed on digital transformation since 2020 to 2022. Sasha is a leader of digitalization for IOML since 2022, and also the technical committee of TC6 for IMECO digitalization since 2021. It's a privilege to have Sasha here in our event. And Sasha, you have the floor. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Hugo, and thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present to you here uh, some insights and information from the OML, so the area of legal metrology. And um, as Hugo pointed out correctly, um, that's not the only area where I'm actively uh, following and contributing, um, collaborating in the digital transformation area. So uh, bear with me that uh, at some in some slides, it will not uh, focus only on legal metrology, but uh, has some aspects of other pillars of the quality infrastructure here and there. And uh, that's exactly my starting point as well. Uh, when we talk about the digital transformation in legal metrology, we always have to consider the other pillars of the quality infrastructure and Hugo had a, a nice image in his presentation earlier uh, what that uh, quality infrastructure is and what the connections are in between those uh, uh, pillars and when you look at those pillars um, here in a slightly different ordering um, that you see and there are many connections between the different bodies, between metrology calibration, between accreditation and conformity assessment, between um, even between standardization and metrology and standardization and market surveillance and regulatory framework is all over the place as well. So when you consider these connections and try and approach digitalization, if not digital transformation of that quality infrastructure, then you see uh, that you need to digitalize all the aspects, starting from how are the statements being um, communicated and uh, uh, packed, like in a certificate. These need to become digital certificates, and I will come in a second to the point what that actually means. Um, we also need to have end-to-end -end digital processes, meaning that all these arrows between different uh, elements here in that image uh, need to become digital. Um, that means that uh, we also need to come um, need to uh, move from sending emails around or using some kind of uh, uh, cloud drop um, storage um, to actual automated processes so that an accreditation service can communicate automatically with methodological service. Um, this is necessary to have an efficient digital quality infrastructure. So like everywhere, if you um, digitize, digitalize um, a, an inefficient process, then you have an inefficient digital process. So we should take the opportunity in digitalization to also revisit the processes that we have in the quality infrastructure. And all this, of course, also requires harmonized interfaces um, between these different elements. And one example uh, where you can start looking at this is uh, a measuring instrument that has elements from legal metrology, um, like uh, here this, um, this fueling station. Um, looking into the future, this is a H2 fueling station. Um, so there's metrology, how do you measure? There's legal metrology because there are regulations. There are some, some standards involved, uh, standardizing how the measurement should be carried out, but also how the storage of the H2 has to be um, integrated in order to avoid uh, accidents and incidents. 
Um, you need accreditation uh, for the um, safety inspections, for instance, or safety, uh, safety testings. You have market surveillance, of course, when it comes to the legal methodology part in particular, and all over the place you have certain amounts of conformity assessment. Now, when you go through the development of such a fueling station, then you see that there are several steps involved along the product lifecycle. From the product design over testing, the uh, initial conformity assessment for so type approval, placing it on the market, and then usage. And when you want to have all of these steps provided in a digital way, then you see that there are so many things that need to be interconnected. So the test reports need to be uh, available in the digital form that can be understood or be integrated easily in the conformity assessment. And ideally, uh, this is then also the starting point uh, for a digital nameplate and declaration of conformity that can later then result in a kind of a digital certificate in the uh, re-verification, for instance. So again, several building blocks that are uh, that, that are connected throughout the, in this case here, the life cycle uh, of, the, of the product. And this life cycle of a product is something that comes uh, more and more into um, the uh, discussion uh, when it comes to regulation and uh, circular economy. And it's, you can start looking at this by considering that for the physical product life cycle, you also have a digital product life cycle, right? So like in the example I had before with the HT fueling station, you can uh, sketch a similar life cycle for, for many, many products, not only in legal methodology, but, but basically everywhere. And in Europe in particular, uh, there is a digital product passport, let's call it movement or initiative, and to implement digital product passports that encode that digital product life cycle from uh, beginning to end. So from the design of the product to the recycling of the product to help um, a, an increased sustainability to um, improve or enable the circular economy and thereby uh, ensure um, uh, reaching the goals, uh, the these, these sustainability goals. And uh, not surprisingly, that uh, comes um, as part of a new eco design for sustainable product regulation and digital product passports. So you may wonder, why do I tell you this? I mean, it's an European uh, development. Why should you care? Well, in many areas, if not in all areas, the a product or parts of the product start not in Europe, but somewhere in the world is connected to others. So the requirements that uh, will be placed on the products also need to or will come to requirements on, on um, parts of the product elsewhere in the world. So um, it's not that unlikely that similar developments uh, will, um, will start to be developed in, start to be um, initialized in other areas of the world as well and then maybe or hopefully compatible what is uh, what is currently uh, carried out here. From the perspective of uh, the quality infrastructure or particular from the perspective of legal methodology, this is a great opportunity because it helps to uh, get a direct access to the customer to uh, first of all um, raise the awareness of the role of the quality infrastructure of legal methodology to also explain and to um, to to introduce and visualize uh, what makes the what is the importance of uh, the quality infrastructure and legal methodology in this case in particular um, the digital product passport is an opportunity, opportunity here because it is a digital way to represent all the information about a product. So there are um, uh, architecture plans for a digital product passport that connect several different systems to provide um, a huge and rich set of information about the product and the product lifecycle, starting from where did the raw resources came from, what was the uh, what were the, the the processes in the production um, up to um, what is the conformity assessment and uh, re-verification status of the product. 
Now, what we need to bear in mind here is that, of course, we cannot upload simply all PDF documents that we have from all the QI processes throughout the lifecycle. Instead, what we need to make sure is that we always provide exactly the information that is needed um, at a certain point in time in the life cycle of the product. And that differs uh, depending on who you are looking at that information. So what role you are there, are you a customer, a, uh, so a consumer, are you somebody from market surveillance, are you somebody from, from an accreditation body and so on. And you need to have this information with a high level of confidence. Um, we all know these kinds of, let's call it dashboards from uh, things like, uh, like an airport. There you have the information that you need at that point in time condensed and uh, hopefully also with a high level of confidence. You don't need to know the processes behind this, but you know that the information you see there is exactly what you need to know, know right now. Is your plane on time? What is the gate you have to go to? Uh, what is the um, what is the a scheduled time of departure. To come there, to get there, we need to again have interfaces between platforms, so we need to collaborate. We have uh, need to have machine readable metadata throughout the product lifecycle, protection, protection against manipulation along the way, uh, for the, in particular for the information coming from the quality infrastructure and high level of automation in order to be able to deal with all these um, large data sets and very volatile data. So again, we need to come up with an, an efficient digital quality infrastructure. The digital transformation group at OML um, is, uh, was created, was founded based on all of this in the background. So there are so many things um, in under development, so many things on the on the horizon that OML needs to react to. There are so many things that OML can't do uh, on its own. So we need to collaborate. So we were OML was were very happy to um, be one of the first of one of the first uh, signatories of the before mentioned joint statement of intent, which is now also the basis of the CIPM forum that Janet mentioned. And the digitalization task group um, was then created within YML to make sure that the um, different activities and pillars of the OML are, are well, uh, well developed and further developed and well um, considered in those activities under the joint statement of intent. Um, I will kind of skip over this uh, just to let you know that, of course, um, the CIPM forum is based on CGPM resolutions, which also aligns quite well with what uh, OML has uh, put on its strategic agenda in this direction. Um, we have been able to um, attract uh, a large number of participants from the OML member states. So we have uh, 20 participants and uh, two corresponding members to organizations in liaison, um, regular meetings uh, for, for the development and consideration of joint activities and um, strategic projects. Speaking of that, well, we started, of course, with uh, some, um, some, some, let's say, uh, boring formal stuff at the beginning, so we need to have a kickoff, uh, work on the terms of reference, um, need to have approved by the uh, CIML, which is the uh, kind of the general uh, council or congress of the OML um, every every year in in October, chairperson selected. So uh, I'm one of the chairpersons, and the vice the vice chairperson is uh, Yang Ping from NIM. China. Uh, we have an official website where you can find more information and uh, go to that later on. And uh, you should be should have the slides being provided to you later on as well, I hope. So what is the scope actually of that digitalization task group? Well, um, of course, we want to digitally transform the OML work. That's a clear statement, but doesn't say anything on its own because it's unclear what that exactly means. And in fact, uh, this is 
one of the major uh, activities of the OML digitization task group um, to discuss what does that mean? What are the important elements of the OML work and what does it mean to digitalize them and what is the best way to, to get there? We also um, have in our scope the uh, fostering of the scientific exchange on digitalization and legal methodology. I will come to a few examples on that uh, in a minute. We support other groups within OIML, uh, in particular the, the group um, of the emerging economy and methodology systems. And we also um, represent the OML in the CIPM forum that Janet mentioned already. So uh, the DTG is, can also be considered as kind of a mirror, um, mirror forum um, to the CIPM forum. Now we get a warning message from Zoom. I hope you can still hear me. Can somebody please yes, yes. confirm that I'm still here? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, Sasha. Thank you. Sorry? We can hear you. Hugo, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I do. We can hear you. Okay, sorry. I just I got a, a connection lost message from, from Zoom. Okay. Thank okay. you. I'm sorry. Good that I'm still here with you. Um, yes, so uh, kind of the mirror, mirror group uh, to the CIPM forum. That was it, so I ended. Okay. Um, one of the first things that we discussed uh, where we wanna uh, dive into as a group uh, within OML is the digitalization of the OML documents. As you all um, may know, OML, uh, the major pillar of OML work is the development of recommendations, which are quasi standards in the area of legal methodology. So given that those are quasi standards, we look into the activities from the standardization community uh, towards the development of smart standards, and we consider uh, steps towards the smartification of the OML recommendations. Um, and of course, the first step is to provide those in a digital way as a PDF document that is already uh, possible. So the OML recommendations are already provided as a PDF document. And the next step is then to decide on a suitable machine readable format for that. And we are in consultation with uh, ISO IEC on how to get there. Um, and it's very likely that we will, to the to a large extent, uh, simply reuse what they have come up to as structure for the um, uh, XML standard for ISO IEC standards. And then from there on, look into further developments to increase the machine usability of the content of OML documents. We also um, created a subcommittee for this uh, December last year because uh, we felt that it's a, a topic that needs more uh, more focus and uh, and hard work to to uh, to dive into these uh, technic technical specialities of smart standards to consult with the respective groups in ISO IC and so on, and that subcommittee has the aim to come up with recommendations uh, to be submitted to the CIML um, next year. Um, that's the plan um, towards a specific roadmap on how to how to carry out the development of the smart oil documents. And also we collaborate with uh, OML Technical Committee 1, which is uh, the committee that is taking care of the um, the terms, vocabulary, and definitions uh, for OML, and we're working with them on a uh, digitalization of that one into a machine readable version that then can be used throughout the future smart OML documents. Um, we are also collaborating and contributing to scientific uh, events like last year at the Amico TC6 M4D Conf. Uh, where we had a special session, digital transformation and legal methodology with uh, three scientific presentations and a panel discussion. And earlier this year, we organized together with IMECO uh, a webinar, blockchain technologies and methodology, and intend to 
continue the discussions on the use of blockchain technology um, uh, hopefully very soon. We're still uh, in the organization of that. We also attended a, a conference, international conference uh, in Lyon earlier this year, and uh, shortly after that, uh, another one, uh, the International Conference on Weighing in, in Hamburg. Uh, for both, the OML had a, an official part in that as a co contributor and contributing organization. And we are happy to use this way to also make people aware of the role of legal methodology in digitalization. And last but not least, uh, our support of the SEAMS advisory group, so the pillar within YML to ensure the, uh, or foster the developments for the emerging metrology systems. Uh, we are collaborating with them on the, um, on the use, uh, on the development of guidelines, um, surveys, and uh, e-learning material um, to improve and foster the uh, the capacity capacity building um in the seams community to summarize um the digitization task group builds upon two ma major pillars one is that joint statement of intent and the thinking behind that and the other is the clear uh, realization that uh, digitalization in the quality infrastructure can only be achieved with a joint uh, and coordinated effort and the DTG tries to uh, make it to try to to support this from the OML side thank you very much Muchas gracias Sasha uh, por tu presentación tema muy interesante en el campo de metrología legal Eh, te pido por favor que te quedes hasta terminar el bloque para tener las preguntas de los participantes al final del bloque. Eh, de la metodología legal vamos a pasar a la acreditación. En este caso vamos a continuar con una. Could you stay until the end of the block in case there are questions? Now we have a presentation from Ferné Chaparro, who will speak about digital transformation and accreditation. Ferné graduated as an industrial engineer and uh, has a. a uh, 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 a master's in uh, business intelligence uh, and he has many certificates and studies in inspection uh, international accreditation in in ILAC and uh, developed uh, if, uh, assessment schemes uh, management systems and right now he's a project uh, accreditation project coordinator and the IAC, and he has uh, experience in research and development. He is the chair of the uh, committee in IAC and the technical secretary of the IAC since 2022. This is was a very brief uh, explanation. There are many, many things we could say about him. And it's a pleasure to have him here uh, with us today. Welcome, Ferney. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for this invitation uh, to talk about the perspective of accreditation related to digital transformation. So I hope you can see my presentation. If not, let me know. So uh, I was very happy to hear the previous presentations because I think the point of departure of the analysis of uh, accreditation for digital transformation comes from the work that uh, you've been doing here in metrology. Uh, first of all, it's important to understand accreditation as an element that generates trust but the world is requesting additional things to accreditation. One of these is for us to be streamlined and accessible. Uh, this, uh, we can become more agile, more streamlined through a digital system. But in addition to this, we require certain elements that make it easily accessible. And this is what leads to 
uh, many complexities. First of all, there are very few accreditation bodies in the world, only 103, but over 115,000 uh, conformity assessment bodies that are accredited worldwide. And this, uh, they generate millions of data associated to conformity results that should be used by industry, by the governments and the end users. So in this component, uh, how can we make this information accessible, these uh, accreditation or conformity assessment results? That's the big question. So in the initiatives, then we have a product led by ONAC Colombia, which is the accreditation body of Colombia, uh, the Mexican accreditation entity, the Ecuadorian accreditation service, and in Metro from Brazil. Uh, Sejecre is its name of the accreditation body in, in Brazil uh, uh, that have been analyzing what we can do from the side of accreditation. The, the IAC has proposed that other accreditation bodies become involved and uh, uh, the uh, Argentinian accreditation body joined, the Paraguayan, Bolivia, Peruvian, Costa Rican also joined this effort. And in addition to this, and as I was saying, in the accredited bodies, uh, over the 115,000 bodies, they support, uh, there are three uh, bodies that support this work uh, regarding uh, accreditation of conformity assessment and some bodies of conformity assessment. We have Asosec uh, Colombia, which is a conformity assessment uh, body association, uh, PCN from Ecuador, uh, and Lenor from Ecuador that's supporting these initiatives. And here is an element. Uh, well, three concerns that we are aiming to resolve. And uh, these elements, uh, the proposal, this is a proposal to take us up to 2030, but one of them is to promote the potential of digital transformation to make accreditation and conformity assessment more agile and efficient uh, for the market, public and private. Uh, in accreditation, the standards establish certain conditions, and these must be published. The scopes that are accredited must be published. And here's an element that's quite a complex one. The market or the uh, accrediting bodies have used this method of using PDFs on their web page with information related to accreditation. When we're speaking about laboratories, testing laboratories, we're speaking about a large number of techniques uh, that have been accredited. And if we think about accreditation, oh, I'm sorry, calibration, uh, what happens on this point? The market, for example, if we're going to establish conditions for conformity assessment of a product, requiring testing or equipment uh, that's been calibrated. It's important to confirm what the measurement and calibration uh, capacity is of the equipment uh, that have been recognized for the scope of this equipment. So it's, uh, you need to go into a web page and then uh, a PDF certificate and the accreditation body can find a laboratory uh, that meets the market needs. Obviously, this is inefficient, but that's the first challenge that we have uh, as an accreditation body. Uh, but another one is to develop a methodology uh, for the unification and reading of accreditation scopes and accredited conformity assessment. It, it sounds very easy, but it's quite complex too. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Janet was saying, uh, we are starting to use uh, different concepts uh, related to ontology here, ontological concepts, uh, standardizing and defining ontologies uh, that 
uh, can bring in this information that you've developed so that it can be at the service of the accredited laboratories in order to start to use these concepts, ontological concepts, and this taxonomy related to certain information, because here there's a challenge, uh, a significant challenge that we need to address. So each country uh, seems to use a vocabulary or a way of expressing the scope uh, that can be transferred between countries and between different bodies. So, uh, because right now different types of uh, or different uh, terms are used for a product. And this uh, generates a certain distortion uh, regarding the scopes that have been accredited. Uh, depending on uh, the machines as well, um, so that the taxonomy needs to be uniform. So no country then wants to change the way that they have cha uh, named uh, the scopes that they have achieved. Uh, we, we need to have them, they need to be of universal use. But, so when we're speaking about a product, this product is often called in, using a different name and the market needs to know exactly if a laboratory or a certification, product certification body, for example, is certifying the product that they uh, have identified in a different way in a different country. That's what we consider in this point. And what I mentioned is that if I tell you 115,000 conformity assessment bodies, we have several ways of creating accredited scope. So over here, it's a key point of the work that we are analyzing within the digitalization project. Another one would be to develop at least a pilot among the IAC members on standardization, traceability of accredita accreditation certificates and conformity assessment for reading and analyzing data and end user information. So over here, Dr. Sasha was explaining wonderfully the entire process of what we should be doing from the accreditation and that certain extent needs to be linked to the unit that has been done on the IOML in countries. We are developing conformity assessment activities, for instance, for gasoline suppliers, the use of machinery to verify the measurement units. And this in turn will be submitted to the oversight and control authorities of the bodies that have in turn assessed those who supply gasoline and the accreditation bodies have duly accredited. Today, we already have an analogous chain where accreditation is crediting a conformity assessment body that is also inspecting organizations and companies or fuel distributors are doing and we already have a clearly defined chain for quality infrastructure now the issue is how we are going to create a digitalization so it's immediate in order to be more expedited and efficient with reading information so over here we have some analysis that we do regarding our attempt from the accreditation in the Americas, and it's to reach agility or be expedite, which is what was mentioned, reliability, and that's to strengthen how we are going to work when we start working from a digital scenario to maintain reliability in our information. And here we have an analysis on new technologies, and we're looking whether with blockchain would be the type of technology that could help us transmit data in a safe manner for conformity assessment, taking into account data processing of millions of data points. We're talking about metadata. And it's not just with that analysis, but also the accreditation in terms of standardization and metrology. Accreditation has a component, a particular component, and it uses other two pillars 
of quality infrastructure being metrology and standardization. Accreditation is we're not useful if we do not have these two structures of quality infrastructure. Metrology can create digital certificates independently and will not require accreditation. Standardization can also develop standards, but it does not require accreditation. However, to be able to determine the conformity elements, we use equipment teams and accreditation. So accreditation is the hub for developing and putting into practice the conformity assessment concepts by using standardization and metrology. That's why the work that you will be carrying out, and it's what Dr. Sasha was explaining, it's essential for developing conformity assessment and assessing the accredited conformity. So, we also mentioned within the work that we're carrying out digitalization and optimization of processes. So here we have an element that it's also very important. And of course, in the accreditation activities, we do have peer evaluations, which would be a, a requirement compliance assessment from ILAC, IAF, and in turn, the ISO 17,011, which is a standard where the accreditation bodies operate the way that each accreditation body implements this requirement is specific for each one of the organizations. Now, when we're talking about a digital setting, it's try to reduce the number of burdensome or cumbersome activities so we can make it a digital process. So I'm gonna share with you how we are working on this challenge for digitalization. The other one is to work on a digital culture and development. So within accreditation, we have accreditation bodies that have several conformity assessment bodies and other bodies. When I say several, we're talking about accreditation bodies that have more than 10,000 conformity assessment bodies that are duly accredited and others that perhaps only have five or 10 accredited conformity assessment body. So that difference leads the smaller bodies that have a fewer number of conformity assessment bodies duly accredited to feel that when they go into the digital world is not for them, it is just for larger bodies. But what happens in the development of culture, digital culture, it entails the understanding that the trend is for everything to be digital, to be agile and expedite. The accreditation body that does not go into the dynamic of digital development, then they're doomed to be come this disappeared to disappear because they're not including market elements such as expeditiveness and the efficiency and timeliness for result delivery. So the culture, digital culture and digital development is to see how we move from an analogous language to a digital language supported by the accreditation bodies. So the generation of CABs and ABs visualization with better accreditation and evaluation practices. So in the updates that we have with the conformity assessment standards, all are including a chapter associated to AI and digitalization and conformity assessment. So now inspection activities, we're talking about how we're going to address remote inspections and other elements that at the end of the day will be translated into a capacity analysis for the CABs and ABs. The accreditation of competence through information analysis and remote witnessing. So this is the trend. And over here, we have an element that is essential, which is the work that we need to develop with the metrology institutes, as well as with the standardization organisms. And it would be the interoperability of conformity assessment results from the connection between the activity that metrology carries out, standardization, also to generate 
the accreditation of conformity assessment bodies and the digital acceptance of conformity assessment results as a reliable element and here is where we have the analysis that we talked about that we're doing with the blockchain technology and also strengthen traceability of products and to uh, the traceability of reports and certifications is to ensure that the results that come from calibration the tool that was used for quality assessment and the requirement to establish the conformity of a product and asset or service so in those achievements would be the analysis that we're doing on blockchain ontologies and to recognize the need to start to assess concepts such as ontology ai and data reading and information so this is in a very early phase right now we're only identified topics and needs so over here we have an initial activity that we're doing within our project and that is a task force for sensibilization communication and events is to create a communication strategy plan and a project selection survey which is the one that you have the other one is a task force to analyze how we can include remote auditing and new technology elements and we're generating a guideline on remote auditing recommendations, but also we are working on data privacy and security. As you may have noticed, this work is still at the early phase because there is a very large gap between the concept of digital transformation within the accreditation bodies. Like I said, some organizations are already including the concept, but others are still working with analogous elements because they don't see the need currently of working on transitioning towards a digital world. To solve this situation, we created these task forces. One is associated to communications and awareness to try to generate this engagement among the accreditation bodies and the conformity assessment bodies so they can start to understand the need of these concepts. So over here we have the last week of October, the launch for our project that you're more than invited and we will issue our invitations. The other one is related with remote auditing and new technologies. And it's trying to explore what are the new technologies available in terms of conformity assessment and accreditation. The other element, key element, is trying to understand what is the data privacy and security elements for information when we go into a digital setting, how we're going to manage data privacy strategies for accreditation bodies. And it's trying to see if we're going to start working with accreditation bodies in the region, what our strategy will be to better integrate ourselves as a region for towards digital transformation and the relationship with metrology and the relationship with standardization. The other one is regarding the creation of ontologies, standardizations of accredited scope. So this is one of the essential pillars of the A4DT project to identify ontologies and the need to establish open standards to try to define, better define the scopes that are being accredited to create the digital certificate concept. The other one is regarding digitization and process optimization, like was mentioned before. If we digitalize processes that are not optimum, then we're digitalizing inefficiency. So there is a task force that is led by Paola Marcico from Argentina, where we're going to work on the concept of digitalization and optimization of processes to try to improve these aspects within the accreditation bodies. And finally, we have the 
agile development and is trying to work on lean concepts and agile methodologies like Scrum to be able to move forward and push projects that are being developed in the region associated to digital transformation have a proper control and thus we don't lose the methodology that this digital transformation projects require. Well, this is the information that I have currently from the project for you. It's information that we are still developing. We're still working on this second quarter to have more knowledge and understanding of concepts like ontology and to develop digital projects. So that's the main objective of this second semester of 2023. And in 2024, we're going to start developing our first pilot projects regarding digital transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ferné, for this presentation. Can you please stay at the end of this session for Q&A? We're going to continue with our next speaker. We have Nelson Alassal who will present about intelligent standardization or standards. He's a veteran in norm standardization with over 20 years of experience. He's a current director of ABNT, which would be the National Standards Bureau. And he's responsible of developing standards with more than 500 national committees and he supports more, he leads more than 25,000 experts. He's an international expert from the UN in digitalization, helping transform processes for standards in quality infrastructure to better understand country's needs. He's participated in ISO in the definition of international standards since 2021 to 2023. And he's member of the policy, commercial policy advisory group. And he's also part of the information technologies group in 2017 for ISO. Currently, he's member of the ISO smart standards group, and they're developing a new standard group, automated or machine actionable standards for the 4.0 industry. Also, he is former chair of iSolutions of 2010 to 2021. He has broad experience supporting countries in, in, to digitalize information to have strategic competitiveness. So it's a privilege to have him at our event. So Nelson, we give you the floor so you may start. Nelson, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ugu. It's a pleasure. Hello, everyone. I will uh, start my presentation here. Um, and I will just a second. So instead of speaking Portuñol, I will uh, try to, to do it in English. So uh, I think it's going to be more understandable. Uh, I will speak about smart standards. And I'm so glad to see how convergent all elements of the quality infrastructure system are in this moment towards digital transformation. We are speaking almost the same language and we are heading towards the same direction. And this is very good for the world. I will speak also not only what we are doing, but maybe why we are doing that. I will start, OK? So uh, fasten your seat belts. We are in a volatile world. And we are seeing that everywhere. We are in a volatile, uncertain, uncertain complex, and very ambiguous <clears throat> world. and. And we can see that, and I was seeing that in 2019 in a, in a workshop I was doing for Latin American countries. And then, boom, came COVID two months later. 
uh, when I was speaking about that. And then we had invasion of Ukraine and we still don't know what is going to be the next, next impact. But whatever it comes, the quality infrastructure system is what is holding uh, society, is what, it's what holds economy and what gives a structure to the whole planet to cope with all these challenges that we have. So this is our mission. It's your mission, our mission. Okay, so this is a little bit why. And, and we have many driving forces, but I could pick some main driving forces of these changes, mainly digital transformation in one side, climate change in the other side, maybe right in the middle, we could have energy transition. <clears throat> so if we pay attention here in the verbs, this is really very interesting. We are speaking about digital transformation, energy transition, and climate change. Everything is about change. So we are not in a very um, uh, stable world. We are always speaking about very fast changes. And so this is our challenge now, how to uh, redesign uh, uh, our quality infrastructure system to cope with all these new changes all, all, and bring uh, competitiveness in one side, but also resilience and adaptability to uh, to all the, the what we are holding, okay? Economy, society, environment, <clears throat> okay? With innovation and consolidation, which are uh, what we do, especially in my case, standards development, we are always dealing with innovation and, and making this consolidation of this innovation, okay? And so this is the mission of standardization and the QIS. And we have many, many new uh, issues coming up now uh, in, in this moment, in this last years and in the future. Uh, so uh, what I used to say is the particle of innovation is never alone, especially when two uh, areas of knowledge, uh, when, when we have the impact uh, of two areas of knowledge, then we have the sparkle of innovation. And this collision of knowledge brings innovation. And usually we have more interconnected issues coming up for us. Things are not anymore so siloed as uh, in the past. So uh, this is innovation, new or changed entities that create and redistribute value. And we are having to deal with that um, more and more, okay? In, especially in new issues, themes, and technologies uh, that are not anymore isolated. When we speak about Industry 4.0, blockchain, electric vehicles, whatever. Uh, these are just a few examples. AI or <clears throat> sustainability, solar energy, renewables, hydrogen, whatever. It, they, are in, they have intricate relationship with other <clears throat> areas of knowledge. And then we really need this interdisciplinary approach with a high turnover, with innovation at the center, and they are all knowledge intensive. And we will need to bring safety, interoperability, and at the end, trust to all these new issues and how to tackle it, okay? And why do we need standards? Just a, a joke here. Otherwise, we will have this situation in the world a little bit uh, non-functional, so we need standards to bring, and we need the QIS to bring interoperability, performance, scalability, sustainability, quality, and trust in the end. Okay, that's, and even, well, I am a Star Wars fan, and even in Star Wars, we have standards. If you pay attention in all the robots, they all have this sort of connector. And all, all the robots, they, they hack uh, the, the starships using the same connector and they save the heroes every time. C-3PO does that. So we have a kind of standards even in Star Wars. 
George Lucas I, is a kind of standardizer. I think so. So, but let's speak about the smart society and the smart standards. So, when we we speak about getting smart in standards, we are not speaking about this guy here, which some of you might know for sure. The, the younger the young guys doesn't know that. Uh, but we are speaking about that connecting <clears throat> standards to the digital world and connecting to all this ecosystem of quality infrastructure and the users. Okay. Uh, but I, I ask you, how many users do we have in standards potentially here in, in the world? Do we have maybe 8.1 billion people? Yeah, maximum. Okay. Today. But what about um, 45 billion IoT, I mean, intelligent devices today, and maybe hundreds of millions in a few years? <clears throat> so this is the new population of users that we need to cope uh, for the next decades. Okay, so how bring, again, safety, security, accuracy, performance, and trust to this new population that, that are not the humans, but they will need to read something, interpret and execute according to standards to ensure quality and safety, okay? And the smart society is everywhere. It's in our smartphones. It's in smart cities, smart industry, smart farming, in health, the health sector is using it intensively. Even in mobility, we will need again smart. We will have smart everything, smart everywhere, and we will need everything with quality infrastructure. I mean, safety, quality, performance, and trust. For again, not just the one point one eight point one billion people, but for tens of billions of IoT. And today we have human taking decisions. So. Human can, people can read standards of text, interpret, and execute some action. Okay. Okay. But today we also have machines and algorithms taking decisions and they need to read something. I mean, read some requirements, some guidelines. They need to interpret them. They need to execute. They need to read, interpret, execute, and act accordingly. And so this is what smart standards, and as our colleague from the OIML was saying, we, they are doing the same. They are projecting and they are developing new documents that could be uh, readable, interpretable, and usable by machines, okay? That is what, uh, that is our challenge, how to make machines and algorithms understand and act under standardized guidelines and requirements, even qualitative or quantitative, and uh, using ontology uh, and using uh, clauses, conditional clauses, how they will interpret that, okay? This is what we are developing. And, and I will give you an example of this guy <clears throat> here. This is this guy is called. It's it's a kind of example that we could use a simple example and how to apply a smart standard. And this is a real example. This this guy is called Makoto Koike in Japan. He has a small farm, family business, three people. He, his mother, his father. He, it's a farm of cucumber. Okay, they uh, they are planting. They're raising cucumber. 500 kilos a day in the peak of the season, but the planting is not a problem, okay? Uh, har uh, harvesting also is not a problem. The problem is sorting cucumbers because you have nine grades concerning shape, color, size, <clears throat> and the mother, the, the old lady Koiki is who spends the whole day separating, um, sorting, and putting in different boxes the cucumbers. So do you have dark green, straight ones, superiors, big ones, and curved discolor are infused, okay? So we have a kind of matrix here, 
but she knows how to do. Okay, but this guy, Mr. Makoto, he was also a developer of uh, systems, and he was really um, he he was trying to help his mother. So he developed a system of image recognition, and he trained. Uh, he did some machine learning with an algorithm, and he taught a uh, machine to sort cucumbers. So to help out his mother. So uh, he identifies the shape, color, and size with deep learning. Okay. He put that algorithm in a conveyor. The conveyor has a small mechanism that can just push the right cucumber to the right box, depending on, on the shape and color and size. Everything so Okay, fantastic, simple practical it's not nasa it's not for a big company it's for a small business and that can be applied in any kind of small country okay and what 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 are the conclusions well more than 100 percent increased profits more time for madame koike for madame koike now she can rest she can do better things uh, in the work and in her private life. And the conclusion is that love for a mother can turn the world smarter also. But anyway, uh, what does a smart standard need to provide in this case here? Yeah, it needs to be readable, interpretable. It needs to have terminology and ontology, terms, classification, entities. And in this case, should provide requirements of size. No, I mean, so what are the dimensions? What are the shape? So you need to bring some kind of very exact uh, requirements, colors in terms of machine language. Okay, what are the tolerances? And you could also then translate that to, or transfer that to other fruits with other sizes, shapes, and colors. So uh, a smart standard should be really uh, transformed into in some kind of um, uh, different language to be interpreted by uh, by machines and by algorithms and not just by humans because humans know by default some things because we, we have learned at school, we have life, etc. So we can then, this is a kind of example in how to do. So this is a very interesting uh, opportunity for NSPs, for the national standards bodies, and also uh, uh, an interesting opportunity to transform the digital, I mean, the, the quality infrastructure system. Uh -huh. And uh, our, uh, now our uh, challenge is how to transform also use uh, current standards such as, well, for example, how to smartify the 27,001 uh, into something that uh, machines will understand or something that could be easy or ease, uh, easier for people to use in a digital world. How to uh, transform the conditional clauses, can, shall, should, the references, how to transform all this container in, that is a text to a container for machines. So this is what ISO and IEC uh, smart project is doing. This is the timeline. We are now in the piloting phase stage in 2023, and we are rolling out some some uh, some results now. Uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, was shown here by OIML, and this is really very interesting. The levels of um, of complexity of documents or or content. Uh, from pure text and paper to the PDF, which is the level one, and then structured, uh, readable, uh, like XML, till what I, I even call the machine controlled and even a kind of self-learning uh, loop that uh, a fifth level can bring to uh, a kind of big data integrated uh, model of data. 
used for for content either uh, in OYML or in ISO IC. So which would be really uh, the smarter level at this moment. Uh, how this is structured, today we have already XML uh, standards at ISO and IC. We are using the NISO STS, STS schema, which is a kind of skeleton of uh, or main structure of the XML uh, file. But this has not all the provisions for uh, all the needs for uh, the new uh, smart uh, connections to uh, th that Industry 4.0 and machines are needing. So we are developing an addressing framework to complement the uh, NISO SDS schema. So this will preserve the work that has been done in the past almost 10 years, but will add a new addressing framework for the new and the necessary needs that we, we need to implement in terms of information structure to cope with uh, the new uh, model that is being designed. Okay. Uh, ISO, especially ISO, we at ISO we have a regional strategy for dissemination, and I am the representative for the Americas, and it's really very good to be speaking here for all the American uh, countries uh, that are present here. And <clears throat> now at ISO we also have some user value or added value propositions, such as creating some wizard or this is a kind of smartification strategies. So creating some wizard for current standards that uh, are uh, that exists or a kind of uh, extraction tools for requirements or self-assessment tools for also uh, existing standards. These are some of the um, pilots that are being developed. So, uh, ISO is identifying and now with the pilots understanding how the users are coping and are using uh, this pilots. We are trying to explore new business models and accessing and evaluating the impact. Also in conformity assessment, we can discuss this here. But today is a very good opportunity and also making some trainings or Something, some dissemination material to discuss in within our communities. And today we are, uh, th this quality infrastructure uh, community is really very important today. Uh, I have here a design, something to, to call, to share with you guys, uh, uh, some ideas. Here. We have the quality infrastructure system. I, and I think, Okay, we have metrology, calibration, standardization, accreditation, etc. Things are as much as uh, as most as integrated as possible today. But as I'm seeing for your uh, speech and and what I see also is that we can't share data, and the more data we share, we will really be integrated and much more efficient. And everything will start with this smart approach in smart documents uh, from, uh, from standards with the, the requirements uh, absolutely online being able to be shared by the accreditation um, uh, organizations, the conformity assessment, the laboratory, so everybody could being able to share instantaneously all the necessary requirements and guidelines that are generated by the others. So sharing that data will be the future for our uh, QIS, okay? To be integrated, this is it's a famous Unido uh, picture, I think. And then for, also for the consumers and the users to being able in the supermarket, maybe seeing a QR code, being able to see all uh, the traceability of the data. And, and 
ensuring the 3P prosperity people and planet in a more efficient and more transparent way. Yeah? Uh, here, some exercises of business models that I was, was trying to design here to share. These are just hypothetical, okay? For example, a standard here, a smart standard with an API uh, being, uh, being smartified uh, and being sent to a user in a cell phone or in a computer. And then uh, by the, the use of this user, we would have the return <clears throat> of the data being able to understand what was complying or not with uh, the requirements or guidelines of this standard, okay? So we could have a historical uh, return or reply. Uh, it could be unindividualized for the standards body or for the certification body. This could be individualized if it's a service. So we would, would have a kind of uh, for example, for, for human use wizards and self-assessment tools, it could be a practical application uh, using standards and guidelines with a data flow with automatic uh, uh, validation and assessment of the process. And this could be also a model for um, conformity assessment organizations um, with uh, their services online. Uh, also, <clears throat> for uh, machines and for industry 4.0 applications, we could also be having a, a standard as a service being provided to algorithms and machines, etc. And we would have this seven, seven days a week, 365 uh, days per year, 24 hours per day, this being provided and returning what was complying or not. And this for, for example, for the, the uh, conformity assessment organizations, this could be providing for the whole quality infrastructure system, a model of continuous conformance. So this could bring, bring a, a completely new business model and everything could be working as a service uh, online, real time, anywhere. Uh, so uh, this, I think, these are just hypothetical ideas uh, that I'm just provoking in here <clears throat> for us, because we will need really to be fast, to be more adaptable for that big challenges that we have already today, and we will, that might be even bigger in the next few years or decades, <clears throat> and we need to be coping with this, uh, to be digital, to be sustainable. And so digital sustainable and the quality infrastructure system will provide the achievement of the, 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 the sustainable development goals. So uh, this is why we're here. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, and congratulations for the mission that you have and that we have already together. Muchas gracias, Nelson, por la excelente presentación. Vamos a continuar. Te pido, por favor. Thank you for your excellent presentation. I would like to ask you if you could stay until the last presentation so that you can stay and answer participant questions. Of course, I can. I'm sure many are interested in your presentation. It was an excellent one, Nelson. Thank you for that. Thank you. We're going to close this initial block of uh, the worldwide quality infrastructure uh, with the last presentation, which is by Michael Shorts, who will present on the accredit digital accreditation scopes or digitizing these scopes. Michael Shorts completed his training in OVFB. In 19th uh, uh, and graduated with honors. 
Uh, he went to Maryland University, where he studied business at uh, administration specializing in computer sciences. Then he spent five years as a development leader in Intercal, writing the procedures, uh, the calibration procedures. Uh, in an innovative way for constructing flexible standards. In 2003, metal procedures and construction. Building automation in technologies and then a better version of metrology net which is a trademark and this is a mature product now for the next generation of metrological software defining metrology standards through articles that he'd written training MCS, CI, M, M, S, A, and others. It's a privilege to have Michael's participation during this uh, event, this first block of presentations. And we'd like to welcome you and hand you the mic, Michael. Go ahead. Thank you. Can everybody see my screen? I can. All right, perfect. So, so what I was working on, and this actually took me about 10 years to come up with a plan to make this happen, but it was a method for verifying our measurement uncertainties against our labs, ISO, IEC, 17025 scope of accreditation. And I'm going to skip through some of these slides so we can keep it into the time limit. Um, so if I skip through some slides and you have some questions, you can always ping me afterwards. Okay, figure out how to get this guy to start running. So the problem that we have, and I always like to talk about something in the problem domain, is that when we're running our automated software, you know, be it SureCal, MetCal, LabVIEW, TME, something we've developed in-house, that our measurement uncertainties that come out of our software don't match the measurement uncertainties that we're seeing on our scope of accreditation. And how can we get those two things to, to work? And going on the previous presentations, how can we get things put together to where machines can save us time and money? So uh, an area that a lot of calibration labs have is going through their all of their digital or their automated calibrations, looking for where their software could have generated a measurement uncertainty less than their scope of accreditation. Because when your auditor comes in, that becomes a finding that they can have. So the way we currently do our scopes of accreditation is most labs will generate something in an Excel file. They'll copy those measurement uncertainty formulas over to a Word document. They'll go back and forth with their auditor to, till they can get agreed upon measurement uncertainties that go in their scope of accreditation for each one of their CMC lines. And then eventually, <coughs> excuse me, then eventually the uh, accreditation body will generate a PDF and they'll post that PDF on their website and, and use that PDF, a uh, customer may put it on their calibration website. The problem is, is that when we look at these PDFs and we're gonna go look for a dry wells, so we're gonna go do a search, that the typical search engine is gonna reach in there and it doesn't know the different types of equipment and classifications and whatnot. So it'll start finding things like a Rockwell hardness tester, a dry block calibrator, a fluke metrology well. It doesn't give us the thing that we want. So, and that's where we started having the problems is even getting an, an AI to come in and read these scopes of accreditation, there's a lot of variations. There's a lot of difficulties in how all this is put together. So as we were going through looking at these, we found a lot of amb ambiguity that we're going to come into as we start moving into the digital world. 
One of the examples is 800 FPM. We found this on a scope of accreditation in the United States, and we looked at the accuracy and go, what in the world are they doing here? Because this is extremely accurate for feet per minute. That's what we thought they were doing. And we had to call the lab up and find out that it's flashes per minute. So that's an example of what is an FPM when we start looking at it as a, as a, as a quantity on a scope of accreditation. How do we interpret what these things are? And these are places that where people and or computers are going to have problems when we move into the digital age. So then we came across an even, even funnier one, which was 1.7G. Now I know all the metrologists out there are looking at that and they instantly think grams. Well, when you look at you're measuring grams with 2% accuracy, you start saying, what the heck is going on with this lab? Well, 1.7G is G's. And that's how the world measures vibration and acceleration. So that became a problem. So if we're going to have computers exchanging data and figuring things out and, and move into a digital world, we've got to solve a lot of these problems. And then we've got further problems of 22 degrees. You know, what kind of degree is it? Um, one, 101 Newton meters were a little bit better, but we don't know if we're talking force or torque. And then we start talking about percentages. And we have a whole world of problem when we start talking percentages, because a lot of things are percentages of stuff, but we've got to know what that value is that we're talking about. So what we did in the NCSL committee is we went in and created this idea of a category or a hierarchy, and we're calling it the metrology taxonomy. So, and what we're doing is building a set of rules that go into how you define a taxonomy. And we're stealing from the, you know, biological world out there, but we're starting out with a source and a measure. Those are the two things you have to start with. Are you sourcing something or measuring something? And then from there, we go into uh, the quantity being measured or the quantity kind or aspect, however you want to call it. And then we dig into subcategory, 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 because as you move into these quantity kinds, the categories break out very differently from each one of the quantity kinds you're trying to look at. <clears throat> so the example that we used inside of the paper we did at NCSL was source voltage AC sine wave. And you can see here that we're talking about sourcing a voltage and then the subcategory is going to be AC, alternating current, and it's going to be of a sine wave. So what you see in here is when we start talking about voltage, that's where we have our quantity kind. So, so for voltage, we only talk voltage. But if we're going to talk, um, if we're going to talk pressure, we could be in bar, Newton meters, PSI, we can be Pascals, we can be in all of these different measurement kinds for pressure, and now we can do conversions between this. But we wanted to keep the example simple, and we're talking about source voltage AC sine wave, and we can calibrate or we can generate all of these with any one of these different calibrators. So the idea is, is we can keep how we, how we do it at the, at the technique or the measurement methodology level we can keep that separate from the taxonomy. So we have a very distinct difference between taxonomy and technique. Then as we're coming in here, defining the taxonomy, we can keep very minimalistic things in here. So we can say with the definition that's for source voltage AC sine wave, that a minimum, you have to give me the volts and the frequency. You can give me additional things like the impedance, the UUT range, the input uh, uh, place where we're going to. You can give me extra data and you can give me any amount of extra data. So there's no limit to the amount of name value pairs you can add to this, this data as you move it from system to system. But at a minimum, I need to know voltage and frequency for this taxon definition to do anything with it. So um, then what we wanted to do is explain how the, the taxon definition is not tied to the technique or the equipment that's being used. 
So here you can look at voltage at 60 hertz, um, 120 volts. Any one of these devices can do it. When we move to 10 volts, one meg, not all the devices can do it. And as we move to 100 kV with 60 hertz, none of these devices can do it. So this kind of hits upon that. Let's separate the, the technique and the equipment from the definitions that we're working on. So then we did the same thing looking at scopes of accreditation. I can use the same format for source voltage AC sine wave. I can use this for any one of my scopes of accreditation that I want to go in and start digging into. So I can go into to a, a scope of accreditation and I can find out what labs can do each one of these devices and what labs can't, or not devices, these taxonomies. So if I have a device that needs calibrated and I need 100 kV, 60 hertz, I can go search all the accreditation bodies and find out who can do that work. So um, the idea behind this is what we wanted to do was to create a set of tools. And this is a little bit condensed because it's hard to get, you know, 10 years of work five years of work with NCSL all compressed down into, into a 20 minute presentation. But you can see out here with source bolts DC, where we've got a digitized scope of accreditation editor. And the big difference between this scope of accreditation here and this one is here you get a formula. But if you want to figure out what a lab's accuracy is, you've got to break out your calculator, or your Excel spreadsheet and start doing some calculations. The editor that we created that's out on GitHub, CalLab Solutions, metrology.net public, this editor out here actually performs the calculations for you. So you can see in here, we've got the formula that we're using. And then here you can see that we selected the 200 millivolt range with an 8.5 resolution. And we've got a parts per million indicated value and a PPM range. And where we have PPM indicated value and PPM range, we can stick those values in. We can press calculate with uh, 150 millivolts and we can see the system can actually calculate our measurement uncertainties. So, so the big thing we wanted to do with this is build a calculator or a scope of accreditation that actually calculated for each one of the CMCs based on the values that you're going to push into the CMC. So here you can see where we've got one that's doing the AC voltage. And you can see this one simpler, that we've got volts times scale plus the floor. And you can see down here, we've got a floor value and a scale. So now you can see that this is coming out as a PPM. And we can push into it 120 volts and hit calculate. And it can come out and say 8.22 E minus three. And I know people are down to just two digits of resolution, but we keep this extra digit of resolution so you can look at how rounding errors and other things are happening inside of your system. So then what we wanted to do was actually put the software to use. Okay, so we tied it into our system and our system will run an automated cow, grab the test group, take and insert the metrology technique that's gonna be used. Then it's gonna do an execution for each one of the data points. And this is gonna push back a measurement uncertainty calculated by my software. But then what we're able to do is take those name value pairs and we can send them off to our uncertainty calculator where the green here is representing our scope of accreditation and the scope of accreditation now can do a measurement on certainty calculation and bring this back. So what we did inside of the paper is we created a real world example. And the example we used is the, you know, use trailer park metrology. They're a good calibration lab or best cow. And they went out and they've got a 5520 they've been using for years. They've got an ISO, IEC 170252 2017 scope of accreditation. And they've been doing those calibrations for years. They just went out and bought a 5730 and got an accredited calibration on it. So now they can use their 5730 to do calibrations. 
But until they go through another audit and their accreditation body agrees to their new uncertainties, they cannot report any uncertainties better than their 5520. So inside of here, what the software will do is it'll calculate its measurement uncertainty using just the 5730s data, and it'll come back with a 4.9 E minus four. They've created their scope of accreditation calculation that they're ready to hand to their auditor, and it comes in and it calculates an uncertainty of 6.2 E minus four. So the software will say, I'm going to use your uncertainty calculator instead of just the type B specs. And I'm going to send that out to check my SOA. My SOA check goes out and checks the scope of accreditation with the 5520. And it comes back with a 9.3. So what the software will do is say, I'm going to report this 9.3, but I'm also going to store this 6.4 back in the database. So down the road, the lab can come in and say, hey, this may be our best uncertainties ever, and they can use that when they go in and get their accreditation next time. So then what we did is we wanted to come in and we started playing around with the different calibrators and seeing what things would do. And we were playing around with a 5520. And what we noticed was as we were doing this, we were putting in a gray check mark, means that it calculated an uncertainty, but the uncertainty of the software was less than your scope of accreditation, so it replaced it. If it's got a green check mark, that means that the software generated an uncertainty that was equal to or less than the scope of accreditation. So what we noticed in here was as we were running this, we were getting some measurement uncertainties that were just barely better than what was on the scope of accreditation, even though we were using the 5520. So this may be, or this is a, a good example of where doing our measurement uncertainties and checking our, our measurement uncertainties every day against our scope of accreditation, instead of once or twice a year when we do our audits, could actually prove to be very beneficial for the calibration lab. So, um, on to questions and comments, and I think we're doing this all in a pool. So I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Michael. Gracias por tu presentación interesante. Thank you for your interesting presentation, Mike. Cool. It's very interesting for participants, certainly. So before I move to the Q and A, I will share with you a survey and I will put it on the chat so you can answer it while we answer your questions and we will be keen on paying attention on the Q&A. This will be the link for our survey. Thank you very much. So we will start with our Q&A. Remember that you can write your questions on the chat. And please don't forget to write who you are asking the question. While we are writing down our questions, you would see this form that you can fill out. And the idea is to collect your suggestion, proposals, international cooperation proposals, idea, other interests for this segment. So I'll see this. We have 10 minutes to use this. And after this, we will start with Q&A using the chat.
Según nuestra agenda, nos quedan Based seis minutos. Based on our agenda, we have six minutes to fill out this form. Pues gracias. Nos quedan dos minutos para iniciar las preguntas y respuestas. Thank you very much. We have two more minutes before we start with our Q&A. Gracias. Vamos a iniciar el bloque de preguntas y respuestas. Thank you very much. We're going to start with Q&A. First question is for Janet Miles. And the question is the following. Thank you very much for your presentation. Could you tell us about some examples 
of how these uh, digital services that are already available by the, at the BIPM site are being used or how they could be used by an NMI. Um, thank you. I think the the first use, biggest use is to be introduced into calibration certificates, as I mentioned earlier, so that it provides a sort of traceability from the result in the calibration certificate to the CMC, which is the internationally approved capability of the particular institute. Um, and the same thing with the service categories, even if the uh, CMCs haven't been produced. But it can be used more widely than that. For example, on a website, if CNEM has a list of its services, for instance, then it could um, add on the information which is supported by CMCs and which CMCs, and the same thing in the quality documentation. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, I should say that the service has only recently been introduced. Mm -hmm. It will be announced at the JCRB meeting that is coming up. So hopefully the message will be uh, passed out shortly. I'm not surprised if everybody hasn't yet heard about them. Great, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, in, in, in connection to this uh, question, uh, do you have uh, news from Codata? I think we mentioned that you were working also closely with them. Do you yes. have an, a, an idea or a, a, a due date to deliver, uh, I don't know, the status for digital access to digital data of Codata or Constance? Um, I don't know if it is already digital. The data are available uh, through the NIST website, um, but not in machine readable form. Okay, okay. So there is a discussion between the BIPM and Codata, including both the Codata Drum and the Codata TGFC groups. That's the task group on fundamental constants. Um, and of course, NIST to reach an agreement on where um, a digital access to the data should be hosted and where the data would be hosted as well. Mm. Um, the access point can be somewhere else to the data, um, but uh, that hasn't yet, been, hasn't yet been finalized. It's still under discussion and um, I hope we'll be, uh, we'll be able to move forward on that soon. Okay, thank you very much for your answers, your kind answers, Janet. Our next question is for Dr. Sasha. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, could you please uh, do some comments on how uh, we can collaborate with all IML projects? Yes, thank you for that question. So, um, collaboration with the uh, DTG on uh, whatever activities are uh, always possible, in particular in the subcommittees. So uh, one possibility to collaborate with us on the um, smart OML standards um, activities would thus be to just uh, contact uh, me and I can then hand over that contact to Katja Delak from uh, NIST or you contact Katja uh, directly because she's the head of that subcommittee and those subcommittees are uh, wide open to whoever would like to um, contribute and I see Katya is here on the call as well uh, so I hope that I <laughs> that I put that message <laughs> right right out there um, we are we we really see in the discussions we had so far that it's good to bring um, different opinions and experiences uh, to the discussions to make sure that we have all the perspectives uh, considered. Thank you very much, Sasha, for your answer. That's, that's, those are great news to, to, be, to have a chance to collaborate further on these efforts. Uh, our next question is for Ferney. 
Eh, gracias por la excelente presentación, Farnay. Thank you for your excellent presentation, Farnay Chaparro. The question is regarding mass information that is being generated in the conformity assessment. Do you have any initiative in IAG so this information can be accessed as open data to be able to ex exploit this information as big data? Or if it's not possible, then you can share us whether we have legal restrictions to having access to this information. Information, Yes, I wanted to share about this. Let's say the first thing that we developed in IA is the concept that the accreditation bodies are organizations focused on data. So that is the main recognition that we didn't have before. Given that it's a data-oriented body, it has special qualities on how they're going to use data. And they created the task force related to data protection and information security. And it was created with a group of lawyers to analyze each country's legislation because each country, of course, may have some common parameters. There are other others that are not common regarding information restriction. And one of those is where we found possibilities was in providing data regarding to the accredited scope, which is what was shared by Dr. Michael in his example. Those data are open to the public, they're available where we have restrictions is in information from bodies that have been credited in terms of information to their clients and sensitive information for their commercial activities. So in that sense, what the task force is working regarding technologies to see whether through blockchain and using intelligent contracts, we can restrict certain information that is sensitive for the accreditation bodies but leave other information that are relevant data access to the general public. But this is still in the works. So they're still analyzing this. Thank you, Ferné, for your answer. And we have additional questions. I think for Nelson, the next question. Once again, thank you very much for your presentation, Nelson. Very interesting. And the question is whether you've developed any prototype of a smart standard. Is there any example pilot to be able to study and that you can share? Yes. As I mentioned in my presentation, in ISO, we have, I think, nine or 10 prototypes, which are pilots from different natures that are being developed and implemented. They're in the development phase. At the end of this year, we will be able to have the results so we can analyze them. And this will be public result on the ISO website. You will be able to contact, I'm going to put my email here and you can contact, contact me and I could send you additional material on this project and the results that we are obtaining. But yes, it's being deployed nine pilots with different concepts. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. And we have a second question for you, Nelson. We also heard about open data and several data. Will you promote from your side, from ISO, any initiative for open data for smart standards to the extent where we can learn and benefit from the different quality infrastructure pillars and provide a better service. Okay, that was a hypothetical design that I did here as a proposal. I will be in the 
general the ISO general assembly and I can bring forth this idea because looking at the initiatives that IOML and IAC have I believe that right now would be quite interesting to join us all to have a data model that it's compatible it doesn't need to be the same but it should be compatible so we can generate this big data of quality infrastructure a global one and this way all of us could have a base infrastructure for data thank you very much nelson our last question i haven't checked the chat but i don't know so now we're going to have one last question for Michael. Thank you, Nelson. For your excellent presentation, Michael. And the question is if, if you think it is possible uh, uh, to think about conducting a webinar or to have a workshop on how to uh, to learn on using the NCSLI taxonomy. Uh, at, I mean, I think it's at the code level. And, and I think it will be for the same region, the interests of the same region. Um, I don't know if you can hear me, Michael. Well, probably he's not online anymore. I, I cannot see him. Nobody, Michael uh, Schwartz. I don't see Michael Schwartz anymore in our meeting. That was the last question. So we're right on time for our break. And we will continue after 10 minute break with a second block of Francisco Flamenco. Thank you very much. This is what we have for now. We're going to break for coffee right now. <laughs>